On the 1st of January, the Nigerian president, Goodluck Jonathan, announced his intention to cancel fuel subsidies, effectively doubling the price of gasoline overnight. The subsidies are seen as a lifeline to people across the country, over two-thirds of whom live on less than one pound a day. Weeks of protests and strikes have all but ground business to a halt, but what do they mean for Nigeria and the embattled president less than one year into his term in office? Hello and welcome to Eyewitness with me, John Rees. Although President Jonathan has agreed to backtrack somewhat on the fuel hike, the protest looks set to continue. People are uniting under the banner of Occupy Nigeria to highlight the wider injustices at the heart of Nigerian society. Decades of bad governance and corruption have left a crippling economic and humanitarian legacy in what should be one of Africa's wealthiest nations. Some commentators are hailing the protest as the start of a sub-Saharan awakening, drawing parallels with the Arab Spring. But are they right to draw such comparisons? Alex Crusher reports. The waves of strikes and protests sweeping across Nigeria have caused some observers to hail 2012 as the start of an African awakening. Protests began after the government removed its subsidy on fuel, effectively doubling the price of gasoline overnight. Despite having its own vast oil reserves, decades of mismanagement mean that Nigeria imports the majority of its fuel from outside. The subsidy, which brought the price of gasoline down to about 40 cents a litre, is a lifeline for many Nigerians, over two-thirds of whom live on less than $1.25 a day. For many of the protesters, however, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Gathering under the banner of Occupy Nigeria, people have united to voice their anger at the government's repeated failure to deal with economic and social problems and rampant corruption. Camps have grown over the past weeks in public spaces in Abuja and Lagos. The movement also has a massive online presence. Facebook pages and Twitter have united the Nigerian street with the diaspora, where people are using faster internet connections to spread images and videos across the world. Indeed, the methods and imagery of the protests have inevitably led to comparisons with the Arab Spring. But do the similarities stop there? Unlike North Africa, regime change is not so obviously on the agenda here. Rather, the occupations articulate people's frustrations at the gulf between the poor majority and the wealthy political elite. These calculations posted on one blog show a Nigerian senator's monthly salary equivalent to 15,000 US dollars. In addition to this, however, they are also allowed to claim a further $118,000 in allowances every month. Indeed, 109 senators have totaled over $170 million in allowances over the past year, and such abuses of power have ingrained mistrust among the Nigerian people. National security issues also continue, with a seemingly perennial cycle of sectarian attacks and reprisals and ethnic violence. Religious and tribal divides have long been played upon by politicians to drive wedges in society. Occupy Nigeria is seeking to transcend these to form a united movement for all Nigerians. It is still early days for Occupy Nigeria. This may not be the start of a revolution, but the new age of mass communication and online social media used to such great effect by the Arab Spring, is now taking Nigeria's message to a global audience, leading many to hope this could mark the start of a popular drive for accountability across Africa. Well, joining me in the studio is blogger and citizen journalist Kaode Otomisi and Roddy Barkley, Africa analyst at Global Risk Consultants Control Risks. Thank you both for coming in. On the line from Lagos, I'm pleased to welcome Yemeni Admalekum, Executive Director of the Enough is Enough Coalition, an organisation which has been central in the Occupy Nigeria project. Yemi, just tell us, what's the latest situation there? Um, that 
strikes were suspended this morning by the labor union, but as we're saying now, the strike is sort of different from the protest. So even though the strikes have been formally suspended, people still came out on the streets um, today. In Kano and Lagos, there was heavy military presence, but um, a few people still showed up in different pockets, um, and we expect that to continue in the days ahead. So what is the what is the level of, of repression been like? Because obviously, when we're making comparisons uh, with the Arab revolutions, this has been a, a crucial factor in the space that the protest movements have had to develop. Uh, how's the situation there? Well, it's, I wouldn't actually parallel it to the Arab revolution because it's not quite a revolution. Mm. Um, it's really, I mean, it was, it's mass reaction of years of oppression triggered by increase in fuel prices, and that's changed the conversation simply from a uh, fuel hike to a conversation around cost of governance and corruption. Um, so in terms of repression, I think, one, it's not on a national scale. Uh, the government just picked really key cities, Lagos being the economic capital, Kano having a history of being quite active in um, uh, protest and, and uh, opposition and just deployed lots of military and policemen to get people from congregating. So people, um, they had them in, there were three major areas in Lagos that people congregated over the last week, and they had police barricade those spaces so people couldn't congregate. And the soldiers actually were telling people that they'd been ordered not to allow people to gather together in groups. So you had pockets of people try to um, uh, try to challenge them, but two combined reasons. One, because the strike uh, for today, people were asked to stay at home, and also, secondly, because the news filtered out very early that the military were all over town um, conducting stop and search and blocking roads, that also affected the number of people that came out. Mm. Cody, um, can you describe for us a little bit the dynamic between the labour movement strikes and the strikes on the streets? I mean, this has been a, a very important element in the uh, in the Arab revolutions. The support of the unions in Tunisia was critical. The in the last few days before Mubarak fell increasing strike wave in Egypt. Um, so there's an important dynamic here always between the street and the, and, and the workplace. Can you tell us how you think it looks in Nigeria? Uh, historically, the labor movement in Nigeria has played a very different role from labor movements in other parts of the world. You know, uh, naturally, the labor movement in Nigeria is geared towards bread and butter issues. You know, they don't deal with the fundamentals. And I think what we've seen in this protest is uh, a, a new generation of Nigerians connecting with the people and bringing out the issues here. Yeah. Uh, I recall as a student activist back in the, during the June 12 struggle against the military dictatorship, the labor movement actually, they used the, the, the government used the labor movement to break the ranks of uh, the organized movement, you know, campaigning towards uh, uh, a democracy. And so it's not, it didn't come as a surprise that the labor movement is playing that historical role again. Uh, this particular labor movement is actually uh, a member of the PPR, PPA, one of the uh, petroleum bodies formed by the government. So uh, it should be seen from the class struggle. So they wouldn't want a, a complete collapse in the system. However, let me say it's a, it's a new generation of young Nigerians you, uh, making use of uh, social media network to bring issues out in the, uh, to, the, to the common people, to the government in Nigeria. Back during our days, we didn't have the technology. We had to meet in mosque to, uh, uh, under the cover of the night to get rid of the military uh, breaking our strike. But now people are discussing, they have access to information. So, uh, you wouldn't compare the labor movement in Nigeria to the labor movement, say, in Czechoslovakia or in the United Kingdom uh, or other parts of the world. I think it is still, if, if the revolution in Nigeria is going to take place, it's got to take place without the uh, labor movement uh, getting involved in uh, uh, the, the organizers of Occupy Nigeria must now be central in discussions. I mean, you can't shave the, the head of a man or a woman in his or her absence. Uh, I think lessons will be learned from the, 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 the failure in this protest. And I think I keep telling people, this is not a revolution, but it's a test run towards the Nigerian revolution. Mm. Uh, Roddy, how hard do you think these strikes have hit the government? We've seen a bit of a retreat today, enough to, um, to break the pattern of the strikes. Um, is this a, a kind of fundamental solution for the government, or are they just buying time? Um, I think, well, first of all, I think it certainly has been the greatest test of Jonathan's presidency to date. Um, he had early successes, but there's been a sort of a slow patch in which there hasn't been a huge amount of progress in terms of passing reforms. 
um, and, and that's really been felt amongst the populace. Uh, and then this reaction that we've seen to the removal of the fuel subsidy has really um, strained government relations, both in terms of its relations, its social contract with the populace, but also in terms of internal relationships, relationships between the executive arm and the legislative arm of government. Um, there was opposition within the legislative arm to the reform, uh, and that's probably one of the, the, the key driving factors between Jonathan backing down uh, and um, uh, adjusting the petrol price uh, to reflect that political opposition and popular opposition. I think um, comparisons to the Arab Spring are perhaps somewhat misleading um, in the sense that th this isn't about uh, political change, forcing political change. This is about Nigerians and Nigerian history uh, and the fact that after years of sort of shattered promises um, and abuse of the system, uh, that, 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 that social contract between the government and, and the electorate has really broken down and the confidence in the uh, government has broken down. So when the government tries to force what could be quite an important economic structural change, the population doesn't believe that that removal of what is seen as a very tangible benefit provided by the government uh, can be replaced by what are essentially quite vague assurances that the government would reinvest that money in a, in a, a, a sort of a, a, a manner that would uh, benefit the poorest sectors of society. Mm.